Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Inside IBM's Winning People Strategy. My name is Stephen Kramer, and I'm the Chief Development Officer at Bright Horizons. I'm joined today by two of IBM's top people practice leaders, VP of People Strategy and Talent Management, Deb Butters, and VP of HR, Lindsay Ray McIntyre. I recently had the privilege of being at the Working Mother Conference when IBM was awarded the Pinnacle Award for having been on Working Mother's list of best employers for each of the last 30 years. The only other organization to achieve that was Johnson & Johnson. Having held a wide range of HR leadership roles with IBM, Lindsay Ray is known for implementing innovative, transformational HR strategies that drive business performance and capture HR shifts in the marketplace to keep IBM competitive and attractive. Also with an extensive career in HR leadership, Deb is currently filling a newly created role at IBM focused on co-creating experiences that optimize employee engagement and business performance, as well as leading IBM's global talent organization. On behalf of Deb, Lindsay Ray, and the entire Bright Horizons family, I'd like to welcome all of you to our webinar, which will focus on how IBM has transformed their culture and people practices to continue to differentiate themselves as an employer of choice. We'll dive right into the content after just a few housekeeping reminders. First, we'll be tweeting live at BH at Work. I hope you'll join the conversation with the hashtag SawLive. If you experience any technical difficulties, please click the Help button or type a question into the Q&A box so that our hosts may assist you. We encourage you to ask questions at any time by typing them into the question widget. We'll do our best to answer questions throughout the webinar or at the end of the session following the presentation. I'd like to turn it over at this time to our esteemed Lindsay Ray McIntyre. Thank you so much, Stephen, and thank you for having us today on this, uh, on this great event. A little bit about, um, about IBM's uh, core, if, if, if we can set the stage. At IBM, we have a framework that we use internally and also externally with our clients to help folks understand IBM. We've been around for over 100 years, but have reinvented ourselves so many times over the years that it's important to keep reminding our clients and the marketplace who we are today. We have one purpose, and that is to be essential. You can see on the chart that is shared on the webinar that it is our complete intent and aspiration to amaze, delight, and surprise our clients with the magnificence of all that IBM has to bring to them through the talent that we have in our company and through our partners. With this purpose, we have three values. IBM has always been very proud of our values that, that transcend uh, the IBM experience as an employee and as a client. They are the dedication to every client's success, innovation that matters for our company and for the world, and trust and personal responsibility in all relationships. We've never defined ourselves by what we make or what we sell. Instead, we've used these as a framework to help our employees understand the compass of our company, the integrity and the rules by which we prioritize our days and we navigate unknown spaces. Accompanying these three values are nine practices. How is it that we will know what to do? How is it that we will know when they show up? And so we have these nine practices to de define how we behave. We put the client first. We listen for need and then envision the future. We share expertise. And those align to the dedication of every client's success on the previous chart around values. We restlessly reinvent for our company and ourselves. We dare to create original ideas and we treasure wild ducks. In IBM, we have the benefit um, and, and real <clears throat> um, competitive advantage of having amazing technical capability 
and expertise. And so it is important that we harness all of that and really um, allow our employees to have the empowerment and encouragement to go into unknown spaces and to really risk, take, and innovate so that we can stay on the leading edge of our industry and stay on the leading edge of providing the best to our clients. So the three in the middle align to innovation that matters. And then think, prepare, rehearse. Unite to get it done now and share personal interest. Align to trust and personal responsibility in all relationships. IBM does business in over 170 countries. Not all of those countries have the same laws, rules, or regulations. It's important that our clients and our employees understand that the IBM experience is a similar experience regardless of where in the world you meet us. And so we use these 139 framework to um, provide our employees with um, a consistent understanding of what it means to be an IBMer and to be clear with our clients about where we stand foundationally. IBM has been in uh, the business of prioritizing our employees for a very long time. We started uh, leaves of, leave of absence policies in 1956. Some of you are aware of what we believe to be the first equal opportunity statement that was released um, by T.J. Watson around equal work and equal pay. We hired our first woman in 1899 and appointed our first uh, female vice president in 1943. So we have an amazing history to stand on. Um, we have the benefit of having engaged with leading edge partners to do work that was important for our employees to be an employer of choice and to support our growing working family dynamics around the world. In the United States, we created the first nationwide child care referral service in 1983 and expanded that to include elder care in 1989 because we knew then that women were entering the workforce in droves and we needed to be able to support them and the family dynamics in order to allow them to be successful employees. What flexible work arrangements mean today have drastically changed. The benefits that we offer our employees have changed in line with the changing environment of how work gets done, how our employees need to connect to their homes, to their families, and to their clients and their work colleagues are changing every day. So our commitment has always been to ideally spot and move ahead of the demand so that we can continue to provide our workforce with leading edge solutions that allow them to bring the best of who they are to work every day. That has included part-time. It has included in uh, incorporating uh, formal flexible work schedules I had the benefit um, of uh, attending the Working Mother Conference that Stephen referenced um, a couple of weeks ago and had a conversation um, with colleagues from other companies about uh, leave policies that have uh, expanded recently in the United States. And my comment for IBM is that flexibility is so assumed in IBM that it actually took us a long time to formalize a more expanded leave policy because so much of the IBM workforce just has flexibility ingrained to how they navigate every day. That said, we had to expand our leave policy formally because it's important as we are being compared to our colleagues um, and, and competitors that, uh, that folks understand IBM's formal policies and positions. When I started uh, in IBM's HR organization, I had the benefit of leading our Global Work Life Fund, and that was over a decade ago. Um, that was our commitment to um, child care and elder care programs around the globe, and we'll talk more about that later. But it's really a commitment to our people. It's a commitment to um, understanding and foreseeing the dynamics that are incurring in the marketplace and in our people's 
uh, lives and being able to provide them with support to continue to stay on the leading edge of what matters at home and in the office. So with that, Stephen, I, uh, I would uh, ask you to, um, to join me in, uh, in being able to, to talk to uh, and, and invite Deb to the conversation on our broader cultural transformation. Absolutely, that sounds great. And certainly, Lindsay Ray, we have appreciated the long-term relationship with IBM. And you know, as I reflect on the slides that you presented, you know, it's amazing how long the history has been around uh, IBM and, and the commitment to work life. Uh, it's curious to me when you look at the values and you use words like magnificence, and when you look at the nine practices and you have words like treasure wild ducks, um, you know, how, how do things like that go over in what is generally seen as a fairly traditional workforce? Um, you know, how, how do the employees of IBM really uh, engage with those kinds of principles? I think that it shows up in all kinds of ways. We have um, a, a huge um, millennial population that, that is growing, and De Deb will speak more to this, but there's really a new sense of having an on-demand um, experience with IBM, and we are using lots of um, social tools to be able to provide ideas and innovate. And our researchers and our, our folks who are coming up with the new latest and greatest technologies have um, an incredible amount of freedom to explore and to try something new. As we are competing in today's world, we are in a fail-fast environment, right? We want to experiment with um, new innovative ideas and to be able to make decisions on whether we want to grow those or we want to zero base them and start over. And so um, folks who are learning um, about IBM today will see a much different, much faster, much more nimble, agile IBM as, as we start to you know, create leaders and, uh, and client experiences that are much more dynamic as opposed to pre-thinking, overcooking, um, and having something that is perfect, um, which is something that has been uh, has been the IBM of the past. Perfect. Thank you. That that's actually a perfect segue uh, to a short video that I know that uh, the Deb can introduce. So perhaps Deb is having some technical challenge or is on mute, uh, but we did want to share with you a short video uh, that really does highlight uh, the new IBM as Lindsay Ray was just describing. Thanks, Stephen. I actually was on mute, and I would be happy if we could actually fast forward to the video at this time, and it will actually demonstrate the difference in IBM. Hi, Watson. Annabelle, your birthday is tomorrow. I'm turning seven. What did you ask for? A princess and a pony. You like things that begin with P. I like pink frosting, too. Will you have a cake? Yeah, I was too sick to have one last year. The data your doctor shared shows you're healthy. Are you a doctor? No, I help doctors identify cancer treatments. I want to be a doctor someday. I can help with that, too. Watson, I like you. Great. I hope you all enjoyed that video a moment ago. Um, I think um, IBM of today is very different um, than the IBM that many of us would have um, interacted with over the last decades as clients or as consumers. Um, hopefully you will remember that this is the IBM that developed the punch card. It's the IBM that uh, developed the selective typewriter that many of you may remember. And it's also the IBM that you may remember produced the world's first PC. So what you just saw was actually a launch of IBM's new era. It's called the Cognitive Era. And uh, for many of you on October 6th, if you were watching uh, the Monday Night Football, would have seen the launch of new adverts, including the one you just saw. 
This is part of IBM's next generation, and it's part of that transformation that we are making. Over the next few minutes, I really would like to talk to you about that transformation that IBM is making because I want each of you to be able to think about this in the way that your companies are transforming and how you are doing that. In the next section, I will in fact go through five key elements. But before that, what I'd like to do is really just do a quick setup for you as to the transformation that companies like ourselves and you are going through. If you happen to be in an IT company, you'll probably readily recognize that there are a major set of shifts that are going on in the marketplace. And that would be around data and the enormous amount of data that's doubling over two years. It's about the cloud-based technologies that many of our companies may be more familiar with. And it's about social engagement. Now, what's interesting is any one of these shifts would have caused the same level of disruption that we would have seen two decades ago when the internet first came about. But we have now three, if not more, operating at the same time. This is causing a lot of disruption, positive disruption, in a lot of our companies. So with that, and the, the speed with which um, industries are evolving, it's becoming very, very clear that companies, and if you are an HR professional, you need to be able to figure out a people strategy that will accompany that transformation. Okay. And the cognitive era that you just saw is actually going to cause a lot of change in all of our industries. It will scale the level of expertise. It will change the engagement that each of you will have with your customers. And it will change your operations. And as you will see, it will change the way that we will do research. So let's take a look at these five key elements. The first one I'd like to talk about is around the next generation of talent. I will then talk about the skills as a new currency, followed by the area of talent ecosystem. I'll then talk about um, leadership and the importance of leadership in any transformation that any of our companies need to go through. And then finally, I'll talk about this topic of segmentation. All of these areas are going to be critical, and IBM has identified them as critical shifts that we need to make to accompany the massive transformation that we are seeing in the marketplace. Again, I hope you will find parallels in each of your businesses. So let's take the first one. Let's move over to uh, the first topic of uh, the next generation. So the happy picture shown here is this next generation of millennials. So today our workforce is made up of about 35% of millennials. These would be individuals aging generally between 20 and 34. What we do know is that by 2020, we will have a massive shift of millennials representations in our workforces, somewhere upwards of 46%. So this uh, represents a, a massive opportunity for each of our businesses. Not only is the size and scale of millennials increasing, but also um, we are finding that millennials are increasingly in positions where they're making big decisions for companies, whether that be around uh, purchasing information, purchasing vendors, etc. So their decision power is getting increasingly important. We also know that millennials have grown up, um, as I'm sure many of you on the phone here today, um, in the digital age. And um, we know that because of obviously what we see around us and the digital um, devices that are being used and how information is being shared. So this is in a generation like many generations before that companies like IBM and yourselves are looking to embrace. So what does that really mean? Well, it actually is causing us to look at ways in which we want to attract and retain this uh, next generation. It's helping us reimagine what our talent acquisition strategy should be. So how do we go about sourcing uh, the millennial population? And in IBM, we're looking at different ways to do that um, in terms of our attraction. Um, so not only is it about how it will change um, functions, traditional functions in HR, but it's also changing the way we are organizing work and the way work gets done today. And so HR is transcending many different areas of a company. Not only is it siloed in the areas of typical policies and practices, but we're working much more closely uh, with our real estate planners um, around the work and the environment that we want to create. 
and we're working much more closely with other areas of the business around marketing and branding. And so it's bringing together different parts of the business to really make sure we're putting our best foot forward around attracting this next generation. So let's turn to the next area and uh, uh, in terms of skills as a new currency. So you would have seen, and I'm trying to make a couple of linkages here for us, you would have seen that um, in the opening video that cognitive obviously is going to be pretty important. We see this as our next era um, of, of, of our business. But, but more importantly than that, think about the ways in which it will change professions. And up here you see a great picture here of a nurse, but that is really meant to reflect how um, you know, uh, products like uh, Watson uh, will actually change the way uh, professions like the medical profession will actually operate in the future. Think about the way that Watson and how it can capture information, how it can reason, and then how it can predict and forecast. It will make lives and professions of nurses and doctors very different in the future. So skills is going to be very critical. It will also mean that we will see the onset of new professions like data scientists. And um, as you will see, many of your companies are now investing in this new profession. And, and it's not necessarily new, but it really is the evolution of some of the uh, traditional professions that you may see today, so typical programmers. We will know that not only will it be part of programmers uh, of the future, but in any profession, HR, marketing, finance, selling, Data and analyzing data and drawing insights from data will actually be very critical. So here I'm making a point that skills and in particular the reinvention of professions are going to be very important for each of our businesses. Deb, if I can interrupt you for a moment, I'm just thinking sure. about the first two categories that you laid out that really are talking about a new style of individual coming into the workforce in the millennials, yeah. and they are taking on new kinds of roles underpinned by different approaches. Can you help the audience to understand a little bit about the different kinds of supports that you're trying to put in place to either attract or retain those new kinds of people doing different kinds of roles? Yes, I think um, what we're trying to do is, first of all, on the attraction side, there is a recognition, and I'll come to it shortly, actually, that one size does not fit all. Um, and so as we go out and we're trying to attract different professions to IBM, and just as um, folks on the phone today are trying to attract people to their businesses, you have to understand what is, what is it that makes um, those prospective candidates tick. A lot of that is uh, when we go out and look for early professionals, some people don't know exactly what they want to do. They're very interested in companies like IBM. And what we've tried to do is we've recently launched something. If you're able to go out on IBM.com, you'll see that we've actually just launched a decoder. What that does is it engages socially with a prospective candidate on the kinds of things that they like to do. And so it would then um, actually then point them to a set of careers and or jobs that they might like to apply for. So that's on the attraction side, how we're looking to do things differently. Um, we then move into the retention side. The retention side is how are we enabling and developing these new early professionals coming into the workforce? And we know that that is a great combination not only of education that they will receive with us, but the on-the-job experience that they're going to receive by working directly, immediately with clients. And so that's the feedback that we've heard over and over again when we're socially in touch with our prospective client, uh, candidates, that they really want to combine experience and education. And when you do that in a compelling environment where their work is impactful, that uh, is to, uh, a successful recipe for not only attracting, but for also retaining. Thank you for that. Okay. All right. So at this point, what I wanted to introduce is actually the third area. So just to recap, we've talked about millennials and the, the importance of embracing this next generation. We've talked about skills and making that the pivotal part of our new currency and how we, uh, and how we look at things within IBM. And then now we're going to look at the talent ecosystem. So um, I think you will draw some parallels in your own companies as well. Um, typically, I would say about you know, five, ten years ago, we were a little bit um, insular 
um, very, um, in, in the sense that we would not open up our doors in terms of um, being much more of an open system. In fact, technology has now dictated that we be much more open, whether that be in cloud-based or in, in some of the social aspects that we do. And IBM, like many of your companies, are recognizing that a talent ecosystem is very important to embrace. So what does that mean? So it means a couple of different things. One, it means that IBM is recognizing that people come to IBM and they come not necessarily for a career of 30 years, which could have been the case um, many decades ago. Instead, we recognize that people are coming to IBM like they're coming to your company, hopefully for enduring set of experiences. That's very different than a, a, than a career that spans 30 years. So that means the proposition of each of us as a business is that we have to make sure that those experiences that we're creating for our employees are ones in which they will benefit and grow from. And so that means that they may not stay, and we have to recognize that as much as we've talked about retention. And so when recognizing that people will move on from our respective companies, we want to make sure that that experience is not only a good one, um, but that we want to be sure that we are tapping those skills that have developed here at IBM and making sure that they go to our clients and our partners. We recognize that you know, whilst some skills um, may be commoditized in IBM over time, that is not the case with some of our clients. With some of these legacy skills, it's important that we make sure that they go to the right places. And so IBM is investing a lot in its partnerships to be sure that skills get to the right places, whether that be at a client or a business partner. So talent and ecosystems are very, very important. The other aspect, as many of you do today, is making sure that you are leveraging your alumni networks, and that is a very critical part as well. And so I come to the fourth area. The fourth area is really the underpinning of any transformation or massive change that any company is looking to make, and that is around leadership. So leadership has been identified as a critical part of our success, and designing and developing leadership rituals that support the cultural transformation that we're trying to make is critically important. And so with that, um, we have put a lot of effort in place. Also, we've got um, IBM a rich history in leadership development, but we've put a lot of energy in place in really truly understanding what are those leadership rituals that will really propel that transformation we are making. And so um, as a result of that, um, we are looking to therefore try and scale that. Um, we know that um, a, a lot of our leaders um, are going to take us, they're going to be pivotal, they'll take us into our future. And so we're spending, as I mentioned, quite a bit of time in this space. Yeah, Deb, I, I wonder, and, and apologies for, uh, for interrupting your thought, but one of the things that strikes me uh, over the last couple of categories that you've described is that obviously these are very new to IBM and to other organizations in the way that you're engaging with employees, the expectation around longevity, and a number of the, the pieces that you've described. I imagine, though, that many of, you know, many of the folks in the workforce um, have been in the old workforce, we'll call it, or the workforce of yesteryear. How do you help them to adapt to this new world? So I think, and, and, and Stephen, is that really also in the context of leadership? Absolutely. Okay. So, so let me take that. Um, so I think we all recognize um, that there obviously is a change uh, cycle that every business goes through, particularly a massive change cycle. So what happens with a change cycle is that you typically get early adopters and you will have laggers. Now, any change management will try and reduce the distance between an early adopter and a lagger. And the ways you do that, many of our companies are doing it today, and what you want to do is really put that on steroids. So what does I mean, mean by that? So what you typically want to do is identify um, those laggers. Um, you'd, you'd want to identify them early in the change process, and you typically want to engage them in some of the activities that you're driving. So you want early engagement. You want those laggers to have a voice. And you want them, in some regards, to also be leading some of the key parts of your transformation. So whether that be a specific work stream um, that, that you are lo looking to put in place. Um, all of these are ways in which you can engage some of the laggers. 
But I will, will be frank, I think we all recognize also that some of the leaders will not make it. And that's why I mention that what you'd like need to do as an organization is truly identify those people that can make the leap, those leaders that can make the leap, because those are the people that you want to invest your time and energy, and there will be a very small percentage that won't make it. And I think companies need to recognize that fairly early and help transition those individuals where that makes sense. But the vast majority will want to make the leap, and you want to embrace them, trust them, and engage them very early in the process. Deb, it's Lindsay Ray. The only thing that I would add to that is that we are also – providing uh, the senior most leadership um, at IBM with a very clear um, vision of what leadership of the future is and what we expect of them and how it is different than perhaps they have grown up as leaders in IBM, um, given that many leaders um, who are currently running our, our geographies and, and the company, some, many of them have grown up in IBM, some of them are newly acquired and obviously have their own experiences outside of IBM, but we're being very um, transparent um, to our leadership team about why things are different now, why the, why the marketplace is requiring us to lead in a different way now, um, and how that will show up for them. There's lots of coaching that's being provided and lots of on-demand feedback um, that is being provided. So it is a commu communication um, channel and, uh, and engagement that is perhaps um, much more dynamic and on demand than it has been historically to allow folks to get really tightly connected to um, how fast they are transforming themselves and their teams and how their transformation is resonating um, as, 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 as we go. Right. Thank you, Lindsay Ray. Thanks for that added point. I think the, the piece that you emphasized is critical because uh, what we recognize is in that those sets of leadership behaviors that we've identified to help with the transformation, we recognize that those leadership behaviors may change over the next couple of years, right? So it's, we're trying to be truly agile in the way in which we're looking at this as opposed to a framework that will be in place, you know, for decades to come, unlike the practices that you talked about, Lindsay Ray. I think it's, it's a slightly different approach here. All right, so let me take the last piece, Stephen, which is really the segmentation piece. And whilst it's got the term segmentation, I really want to be able to describe this for you all. So this is the fifth area um, that I wanted to chat with you about, which is one of the shifts we think really is going to make the difference. Um, behind this is really that one size, meaning one size that every employee does not fit. We recognize that there are distinct populations in any business and that there are distinct value propositions for each of those populations. So in many companies, hopefully you recognize that, um, that we have distinct populations like client management, the people that face clients. They may be sellers. They may be consultants. That's one distinct population. We also know that in many businesses we have um, uh, research and technical um, people and they are motivated and they have a, a slightly different value proposition. And then you have in some businesses client services. And these are people that may sit in delivery centers. They may be sitting in different countries, et cetera. What IBM has recognized is that segmentation and the way in which we treat people is going to be very different going forward. And we want to optimize experiences. So what does that mean? That means that we are embracing what's known as design thinking, which is a term hopefully uh, may be familiar with. This design thinking is that we are looking to co-create these experiences with these employee populations. And so in doing so, we understand what their value proposition is, we know what will retain them, we know what's important to them. And so that's what we're doing at this moment. It's a very exciting phase of the people strategy that we're going through this year. And as a result, um, it's very satisfying to see um, direct user experience, in this case our employees, and how they're contributing to creating um, the changes at IBM. So that's segmentation. Um, and really the final phase that I wanted to talk about in terms of the five shifts of transformation. And finally, I hope you can find, as I mentioned, parallels in each of these shifts for each of your businesses and that um, you can find something from this. Stephen, back to you. Great. Yeah, thank you very much, Deb. It's, it's interesting. You know, I think many of us are familiar with segmentation when we think about customers or clients. 
but to actually apply it to employees and employee experiences, I think, is a, is a really unique twist. And uh, I just wanted to uh, go to a question that we received uh, through the portal. And that question was really directed to both you, Deb, as well as Lindsay Ray, around are you using um, any outside uh, partners or vendors as it relates to helping to create some of these unique employee experiences and segmented employee experiences? So it's Lindsay Ray. I can take that, um, and we'll talk about this in in a little in, in a little bit. But I think the beautiful thing about um, about what we're up to is that IBM is very committed to partnering with our own ecosystem, um, and to be able to source. Um, source folks like Bright Horizons um, who are in the best of their their field so that we don't have to be, right? We are not in the child care business. You absolutely are. And so by partnering with folks like you, um, we provide uh, the very best to our employees without having to create it ourselves. Um, and, and we obviously do, do that around the holistic IBM experience, but Understanding that you can secure the best um, partnerships and the best sources for a given solution in the marketplace um, in, in innovative and creative ways. I know that there are folks on the phone who will come from small companies who don't have huge budgets. Um, and there are lots of innovative, low-cost ways to engage with um, best-in-class partners to be able to provide offerings to your workforce as well. And so it's really, um, you know, there, there, there is obviously, you know, a time and a place for us to be able to partner, but we do do it um, frequently and, uh, and really appreciate the opportunity to, um, to connect with folks that are uh, in the best of their industry to make our uh, employee experience the best that it can possibly be. I don't know, Deb, if you would add to that. Thank you, Lindsay Ray. The only thing I would add to that is um, building on your point around companies who may be clearly a lot smaller than IBM. What I found when I got into this role, um, actually just over a year ago, which was a newly defined role, was that there are so many uh, partners and other companies out there that, is, that have great thought leadership. Sometimes, you know, a company as big as IBM, you start to think, oh, you know, we know it all. In fact, we know not as much as we need to. And so uh, what I did is go out, and there are some great, you know, places out there. You can go around the future of work and the way in which work is being shaped, and uh, you can get some really great ideas. And so I will tell you that as we've looked at segmentation, which is where this question came from, um, there are many ways that you can partner uh, with places that are not what you would be familiar with. So there are companies out there that are very traditional in the work that they do today, but actually they are branching out into other areas that are very interesting in the future of work. So my advice is get out there, get it and sense what's out in the marketplace and actually uh, grab some great best practices, great companies out there that you can be working with. Thank you very much, Deb. And so I think with that as the backdrop, uh, Lindsay Ray, if you can continue to help us to think about this key area by describing how you see the changing world of work, I think that would be a next natural path. Absolutely. And just as, as uh, Deb described the dynamic nature of our evolving workforce, we have an evolving agenda around uh, the work-life integration equation. Some of you will have work-life balance. Some of you will have work-life integration, diversity and inclusion. It, it has all kinds of flavors, but the reality is there are enormous demands on um, our employees' lives as they navigate um, wh whatever that means for them. It, it, it is... Um, it shows up as, you know, single employees who have very robust commitments outside of the office around volunteering or um, around, you know, their their personal hobbies. It shows up as, you know, dual working families uh, with with children and elder care responsibilities, um, individuals who are changing. Uh, their their career paths and career trajectories and career aspirations, um, and therefore you know are are looking for 
so many different solutions over the course of their career journey. And so we, for a long time, have spotted that 9 to 5 is a bit of a myth. It's a great song, but it's a bit of a myth. And so providing our employees with flexibility is embedded in our culture, and it has allowed us to have a, a baseline to navigate trends very successfully. You know, we, we pride ourselves in staying connected to our employees uh, to be able to source from them what is important to them and to be able to try and provide offerings and solutions. We also try and stay as strategic as we can, um, and by partnering with folks like Bright Horizons, we are able to rely on your academic expertise and, uh, and research investments uh, to make us smarter about where the trends are going and how best we can align to be able to provide our employees with options and solutions uh, before they will need them. Ubiquitous low-cost technology is incredibly important. We are, um, many of us, uh, I am told, are looking at our phones over 150 times a day. And for some of us, that means that we can read the newspaper on the train to work. Uh, others of us are breaking the rules and doing email at stoplights as we commute. Um, but it means that we have an incredible opportunity to provide um, folks with solutions and education and organization and prioritization tools that allow them to have control over how they manage their own equation. For certain, just as Deb said, around the, uh, the talent equation changing, there is no one silver bullet solution. Um, but for folks who are new to this space or growing in this space, uh, my advice is to get connected to a communication source that you are confident will um, give you the insights that you need. And that can be as small as um, you know, a focus group, a task force, um, you know, a, a group of people who can serve as your, your eyes and ears, your ambassadors, um, and, and to be able to provide you with frequent and ongoing feedback so you have a sense of what's working and what's not. You have to be brave enough to try new things and brave enough to stop things that are not working. There are work-life solutions that worked 20 years ago that don't work anymore, that aren't needed anymore. And so I have to be able to uh, navigate and recommend uh, when we stop doing something to free up space and in many cases budget to try something new. And so we have to be brave enough to do all of those things. Um, we, as I said, do business in 170 countries. We have an incredibly global way of working. We have globally integrated enterprises, um, particularly around our support functions that have centers of excellence that reside in all corners of the world that require many of us to be on calls and on cross-country uh, teams uh, and, and to navigate all of the global nature of the work that we do while managing um, the demands of a work and a personal life requires IBM to be able to give our people tools and the support to allow them to be successful in both places. Great. It's interesting, Lindsay Ray. I'm sure that uh, most of the folks on the webinar today, like me, are staring at this screen and seeing their life pass before their eyes and recognizing that certainly these are uh, very much elements that are affecting all of us. Uh, and so, you know, as I think about, you know, my own role and I think about the idea of interacting with colleagues in you know, Bangalore or Amsterdam or London and think about the idea that I have a six-year-old and a four-year-old, these are all things that are impacting lots of folks on the phone and the employees at our organizations. And you know, one of the things that you just shared that, that really sparked for me an interest is the idea that you are constantly adjusting to these new realities in the programs that you offer. How do you do that review, and, and how do you think about you know, taking that brave step to uh, drop a program or add a program uh, in today's you know, uh, environment of tight budgets and being really thoughtful about what's going to resonate best for employees. So one of the things that I'm using, and I, I am 
also I'm also new to the current role that I have, having spent the last eight years overseas um, in Dubai and Singapore. So I learned a lot while I was outside of the United States about the real benefit of being able to um, test and and to and to do and to do things small and then expand them or or stop them. Um, because in many cases I was opening up markets where IBM had never been before um, in Africa and, uh, and, and in parts of Asia. So it's, um, it's given me some insights and, and, and a skill set that, frankly, I didn't, I didn't possess before. But, you know, making sure that we have um, mechanisms to be able to understand when things are working. And we have great social tools now to be able to engage folks in conversation. And sometimes it's as candid as being able to connect to a population, a conversation thread, and ask for candid feedback. Um, in some cases, we are working with partners like yourselves to understand our utilization or the changing needs of um, the industry so that we, you know, we, we can determine whether, you know, what we have done is, uh, is going to make sense for what we will do. Um, but I think, you know, communication is, has always been pivotal, but now with all of the social tools and the dynamic natures of how um, we manage our work and our life, it, it creates both opportunity and necessity to really get connected to um, the, you know, sort of the, the voices. And I find that our, um, I don't rely on the HR teams to do this because our management teams, our, our executives, our leadership teams, and employees all over the world are so willing to help when I ask them if they'll be, you know, an ambassador for us or I ask them to be a champion for us on a specific initiative. They are so willing. And so with, you know, small HR teams, um, you know, really reserve the right to ask for help, um, to have more wingspan, if you will, in corners that you, you can't get to either because your team is too small or there aren't enough hours in the day. And so it's really about sort of having a, a an expansion of of your function um, to be able to have sort of a a, a volunteer army, if you will, um, to allow you to be more effective and more and more connected. Thanks, Lindsay Ray. As we look at the next chart, I just wanted to provide a little per, little bit of perspective. We years ago created um, what we called the Global Work Life Fund, and you heard me say earlier that I had the real pleasure of being able to take over this initiative um, for IBM when it went from being a U.S. initiative to uh, a global initiative. And you know, we have we have done child care centers, camps, after school programs, family care, backup care. Um, you know, for a long time, um, IBM was was a pivotal um, founding member of the American Business Collaboration for Quality Independent Care, which was responsible for a lot of uh, infra infrastructure investment um, around the United around the United States in in particular, um, and uh, and it it allowed us to partner with. Um, you know, Bright Horizons really early in in um, our in our commitment to providing our employees with solutions that would allow them to to navigate um, their work and their personal responsibilities. So we now have um, 14 Bright Horizons centers. I remember at one time it was even higher than that. And um, you know, we just thank thank you, Stephen, and your team for helping us be flexible and navigate the changing nature of our workforce and where we are. I know that we partnered together to go outside the United States together, um, and uh, and our employees have really benefited from and really enjoyed um, Bright Horizons um, as an ex as an as an experience. Um, you all provide our employees with more than a child care center experience um, because you too have been evolving over time in your mandates and what you provide. Um, and our our employees have the uh, benefit of growing with you um, through your own online resources, your ability to keep them educated as parents on leading edge trends in the industry, um, books that they can read for their children, portals, conversations to have with their teens. Um, all of these are incredibly important real life 
um, problems to solve for, um, for an individual employee. And when we can partner with folks like yourself um, to be able to give them the best uh, advice, tips, resources available, um, they are incredibly, incredibly grateful. Um, in preparing for uh, this conversation, I had uh, the, the pleasure of going back through the archives to see um, just how many employees have uh, have taken advantage of uh, of our relationship with Bright Horizons, and we've had over 10,000, almost 11,000 children go through priority spaces at Bright Horizons Child Care Centers, and over 30,000 employees have utilized College Coach um, to get their their children ready for um, the pivotal university experience. So that is a real testimony to our partnership and uh, and and our respective evolutions. Um, and I know that uh, I know that that will continue to grow. Great. Well, we really appreciate the partnership. One of the questions that just came in um, was really around. It's it's clear that IBM has a very supportive leadership around these issues. And the question really is, um, what do you suggest to organizations wanting to improve the employee experience or work life programs, but leadership is not ready yet? I think you have to start with with what the cost is of not doing it, right? It's important for leaders to understand that, that especially today, as Deb talked about, our millennials have so many choices, and that includes working for themselves. And so if you really want to secure the very best talent for your corporation, you have to be able to provide them with a compelling reason to do so. And if you don't, and you... Um, have um, the disadvantage of making an employee choose between their work and their life, you'll find out pretty quickly that as an employer you lose very quickly and almost every time. And so I think it's putting together, you know, business cases. There's lots of resources available to be able to provide, you know, financial cases, to be able to benchmark. Um, there's a fantastic best practice going on right now, which is which is new for me, but I've benefited um, since I've returned to the United States, which is having leadership teams hear from other leadership teams, and that's sometimes competitive leadership teams or partner leadership teams to understand, you know, what got them, you know, over over the hump, if you will, or what what got them to buy into an investment, or in some cases, it isn't an investment; it's a policy change or you know, just a change in, in how folks are engaging with uh, with their employees. So I would say, you know, benchmarking others, providing fact-based business cases, um, and also uh, allowing for um, your leadership team to understand from your very best talent what it is that they're looking for in an employer and what it is that will keep them. Um, because a manager... Um, we'll find out very quickly um, how important it is for an employee when their very best, most talented niche skill has a personal crisis. And if if you force them to, to choose uh, in that moment, you will lose them. And uh, most of us, at least in IBM, don't ever want to be in that position. So um, those would be my initial thoughts. Thank you. So I am just conscious of time. We have had a tremendous number of questions come in. And so if you all uh, don't mind, I'm going to switch. And obviously, you can read about work life in 2015 on the slide. Um, but at the same time, I'd love to get insights, uh, both Deb and Lindsay Ray, on some of the questions that we have, if that's OK. Absolutely. Uh, so we had a question that came in. Uh, and the question is, what does IBM think are the next innovations in work life supports that they will take the lead on like they have done in the past? So it's a great question. I think that um, you can see on chart 15 actually that we just most recently introduced milk delivery service, um, which we are going to provide that is um, completely, IBM will, will provide that com completely. So if a, a nursing mother is traveling, she just needs to let us know where she is and when she wants to be, to be picked up, and IBM will handle all of the logistics and transportation. Um, and And our work life programs around the world are changing. So not everybody has the benefit of having had the work life drumbeat and agenda that exists in the United States. And so we've just launched a part time program in India that's incredibly important and valuable. Um, and elder care uh, initiatives in you know Singapore, Dubai, Brazil, 
Um, and so for us, it's, it's a matter of making sure that markets that are not as evolved as uh, our work-life offerings in the United States have um, a set of offerings that are relevant to them and meaningful to them. And in the United States, it means us um, really figuring out what, um, what work-life means in this um, hugely social, dynamic, work-around-the-clock kind of world. Um, and uh, Stephen and I were, were chatting in, in, in the um, preparation for this that, you know, that we're still, you know, at IBM we're still learning, and I'm hoping uh, that the Bright Horizons team, team will educate me on, you know, what will the millennials of the future want um, to help um, address their child care needs, for example. Um, is that a traditional child care center or, or, or not? And I think, uh, Stephen, what, what you shared that is, is that increasingly, um, actually, there, there is an investment in, um, in, in cor corporate child care being, being provided as uh, particularly our competitors in the tech space really invest in leading edge campuses. No, that, that's absolutely the case. I'd say that the other one, and this relates to the next question that we have that is uh, directed to you, Deb, um, we have seen uh, a real increase in clients that are asking on behalf of millennials uh, about the student loan debt that they are having as they come out of university. And so again, um, when we think about you know, problems and issues and integrations between work and life that never existed in the way they exist today, um, that is certainly one that we're hearing about. And the question for you, Deb, is you mentioned millennials earlier in your, in your talk. And the question is, is there a work-life problem that you have been frustrated by um, not being able to solve on behalf of this new set of employees that are starting? So I think it, it's, it's a great question. It's actually multifaceted in, in terms of res, uh, a response. Um, but I think uh, we're trying to tackle the, the questions on work-life balance um, in, in multiple ways. Um, it goes back to originally, um, you know, as humans, we do want to generally give our best. Uh, in doing so, we do so for uh, work that is meaningful. And so what we found is that the, the, the typical nine-to-five, which uh, um, Lindsay Ray talked about, doesn't exist. And so what we're trying to do is put in place um, flexibility that allows work to be done where it needs to be done. But actually, more importantly, what we're finding is that where work is done is actually becoming critically important. So um, what that means is that we, we're trying to design environments where um, people come together. And um, you, you will have heard uh, previously a lot of companies have invested in flexible work options where they work from home. Whilst that has its place, what we're also finding is that the millennial generation do want to come together, where you, whether you refer to them as cohorts or at the same location uh, where they have shared interests. So I think what, what we're seeing is that, um, that that agenda on flexibility is moving forward in, in slightly different ways than what we would have experienced in the past. And what we're trying to is, is really kind of get ahead of that. And part of that frustration is moving as quick as we need to. And I think speed is such of the essence that if I were to pinpoint any frustration, it's our ability to move quickly to address some of those work-life um, issues as we look at this next generation, Stephen. Well, the only I thing I would add to that, Stephen, is that, um, and we talked about this briefly, but we're using um, some new technology to try and stay connected to our employees um, through mini pulse surveys as opposed to doing big, huge surveys that, you know, get us an enormous amount of data. We're trying to do sort of more on-demand um, mini pulse surveys to give us sort of quick and, and immediate feedback that, that allow us to provide more surgical um, solutions or, or pilots. And so um, that's one thing that, you know, folks on the phone might, might be interested in um, learning more about. Well, first I want to thank both uh, you, Deb, and, and, and you, Lindsay Ray. Um, I apologize to the many of you who have uh, put questions in and we're not going to have time for. I think that this topic clearly hit a nerve, and based on the participation and the questions that I apologize will go unanswered during this session, but certainly we'll make sure that answers do get out uh, from our two panelists. Um, at this time, uh, as we close out this wonderful event, I did want to just observe that in addition to 
these wonderful webinars that we continue to host throughout the year and that you will continue to learn about, we do also have a live event, Solutions at Work Live, which is going to be April 13th through the 15th in uh, Miami Beach, Florida. And we hope, again, that you will consider joining us and having these kinds of conversations live with us. And in addition to that, subsequent to this session, I do hope that you will uh, take the opportunity to take the survey about this webinar and help us to continue to bring interesting content to you uh, on relevant topics. And in the meantime, uh, you'll be receiving an email uh, with both the video replay as well as the slides to download, uh, and finally, an invitation to our next webinar. And at this point, I just want to thank all of you for uh, your incredible participation and thank the two panelists again for their wonderful insights, and congratulations to IBM and all of your employers on their continued pursuit to integrate work and life. Thank you.